thank you very much for joining us uh, on our fast-moving monolith webinar. Um, I'm Andy Kennedy from Tier 2, and I've got John Cornforth with me also from Tier 2, who's going to do the bulk of the, uh, the demo. Uh, could I just ask you, um, I tried to sort of keep things muted, if you wouldn't mind keeping yourself muted as well. I'm not sure how much centralized control I've got. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that will help um, everybody if we could. So before we dive in, I just want to frame the session a little bit here. A very brief introduction to Tier 2, uh, why we are talking to you about OpenShift uh, this morning. Um, before John does the, the bulk of the webinar, which is the demo, just wanted to talk a little bit about what, how we define cloud native development and what we actually mean by a fast moving monolith. Um, moving then on to John, who's going to demo how you can rehost. In this case, it's an application uh, deployed in JBoss EAP up onto OpenShift. And then finally, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I just want to touch on Red Hat's um, sort of product bundling and how that can potentially help in your uh, journey to um, uh, rehosting, uh, refactoring, and so on. And then finally, just some contact points wrap up and some next steps. So very briefly then about us, so most of the session we're going to be talking about today is around OpenShift and uh, I mentioned EAP. Uh, Tier 2 was the first uh, Red Hat Premier middleware partner in the UK. It was about six years or so ago uh, that we achieved that uh, level of partnership. And that partnership comes from a perspective of skills, services, case studies and so on. It's not about the amount of software that we sell, it's only about our uh, proven capability to deliver. So as I was saying, we're going to talk mostly about OpenShift today, but because we come from the middleware background, uh, we're also experts in some of the other main Red Hat middleware technologies, so specifically Fuse and AMQ. That's the integration and messaging, and also Process Automation Manager, which encompasses Business Process Manager, and also Rules. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the tech skills we've got uh, in very summary terms what we do is we help companies build custom software um, be it web mobile or uh, integration um, so we have the, the sort of the full end-to-end -end project skills including uh, agile um, software delivery um, uh, business analysis and so on but recognizing that not every organization wants the managed project we also offer those individual specialist skills in a consultative capacity as well Okay, so what do we mean by cloud native development then? Well, we define this really as a way of building new applications, or although the focus today is mostly on modernizing existing applications based on cloud principles. So the idea really is to take advantage of cloud computing models. And that's about increasing speed, flexibility, quality of application development while reducing deployment risks and costs. So crucially, as you'll be aware, it's not really about where the applications are actually deployed. It's more about how they are built, how they are managed, and how they are deployed. The diagram shows sort of four tenets, really of four pillars of cloud native development. Talking, starting with service-based architecture, for example, microservices, typically then those services being exposed as APIs, helps us reduce the complexity overhead of deployment, adds to scalability and maintenance and so on. And then from a platform perspective, particularly pertinent today, of course, we're talking about containers. That gives us this common operational model across technology environments. This is about application portability across environments and infrastructure, including public, private, and hybrid cloud. And then finally, the final pillar there, um, moving away from the tech and the platform is about processes, that's agile methods, uh, DevOps and so on, and that, as you'll be aware, is a whole subject in its own right. So just really wanted to touch upon that as part of how we understand and define cloud native development. Okay, so in terms of the options that organizations have got potentially to modernize, <clears throat> we know that those four pillars, they're very worthwhile if you're thinking about a complete refactor. That's the, the sort of the middle, uh, deep, deepest sort of aqua blue there in the in the diagram. Um, but what about legacy applications, which is what this webinar is focusing on? You know, many of these applications are business critical, uh, can't simply be replaced. The risk would just be too high. So, are there benefits that we can achieve by adopting a 
partial cloud native approach. So taking some of those pillars that we were talking about earlier and applying them to existing applications. So the simplest modernization example is rehosting. That's the one at the top and one that we're going to be focusing on today. And we know that this still can provide significant benefit. Sorry about that. So the idea there is always a bit of feedback in these. Um, so the idea there is to just make the deployment faster by rehosting onto a container platform like OpenShift. You know, we can provide increased speed of deployment. But not only that, it's, it is effectively a stepping stone for replatforming, which could provide additional features in a completely cloud native way, or actually give us the ability to decompose parts of that monolith over time into separate microservices. But that's just a sort of a nice to have. Really what we're gonna be focusing on today is that rehosting. That's what we mean by the fast moving monolith. It's rehosting to give us the faster deployment options. And at this point then, I'm gonna hand over to John Cornforth to pick up on the, um, uh, the demo. So let me just see if I can give John the presenter. There we go. And that should be with you, John. No, thank you very much. I should remember to mute myself. That would help too. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. And, uh, and uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, 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 we're going to move application uh, 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 in source code, source code form or is a pre-built uh, a web application um, and uh, we're going to move that onto OpenShift. What I'm going to use are the uh, templates that are provided as part of OpenShift. Uh, those of you that are quick off the mark will recognize uh, OpenShift version 4 on my screen in the background there. Um, and uh, the question is, right, well, where are these templates? You're probably used to going and having a look in the developer catalog and seeing things like JBoss EAP and stuff like that. You won't see them in OpenShift 4 because the template service broker uh, is not installed. You have to install it yourself. So you only get these 10 items in the developer catalog for OpenShift 4. However, don't despair. They are actually still there. If we go into a search and we search for templates, in OpenShift, and also we search in the OpenShift project as opposed to the default project, we'll find that actually all of those uh, application templates that we're used to seeing in previous versions of OpenShift, they're all still there. And the one we're gonna use is the EAP72 basic source to image. So we're gonna use source to image. Okay, so where is my source? Well, it's in GitHub. And there's a, a lovely photo of my ugly mug. Uh, one of the uh, public repositories that I have is this monolith repository. This is where my actual source code lives. It's a pretty basic um, project design. It's got a standard sort of structure you'd expect for a, a sort of Maven project. It's got a POM. It's got a, yes, it's a JSP. So we're using really old technology. That's kind of the whole point. This is not new trendy stuff. This is old monolith stuff. Uh, so we have got JSP there uh, and it's a, it's a fairly uh, bog standard uh, old-fashioned application. So I'm going to get OpenShift to build this project and uh, deploy both the application and the EAP uh, into a container and run it up from there. So I'm going to just jump right in. I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to use most of the time the the uh, the, the OC command. Um, before I do the uh, the new project, I just want to show you the templates that we're talking about in a bit more detail. So I'm using this OC command to describe the template. There it is, each 72 basic source to image, but with a namespace of OpenShift because that's where it lives. It doesn't live in the current project that I'm in. And that will give me a big fat description of all of the parameters for this template. For example, what I want to call the application. Most importantly, the source repository URL. So that's this repository, that's my GitHub project. I'm gonna provide a URL for that so that it can build it. Uh, and a few other things which you may notice from the value option here are actually filled in by default. So I'm gonna override them. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the parameters of this template in a minute, but um, suffice to say, uh, this is the template that I'm gonna to use to uh, create my application. So I'll just clear my screen up and then I'm gonna create a new project to do all of this work in. So I'm gonna use OC new project. 
helps if I'm typing correctly. You'll be glad to know I'm cutting and pasting the majority of these OC commands so that you don't have to struggle watching me uh, watching me type. I'm going to call it JC Webinar. I've created a new project, and hopefully that project is actually visible now in the GUI. There it is, my new project. It's got nothing in it at the moment, but obviously I'm going to create something in a second. So I'm going to use the OC new app command, and I'm going to use my template. And this is what this OC command is going to look like. So I'm giving my app a name of monolith source, because I've got two apps I'm going to create today. One is from the source code, one is from pre-built WAR. Uh, so this is going to be called monolith source. But you'll notice also that the template itself has a parameter called application name. This is what all of the objects in OpenShift are going to be called. And so I'll explain a bit more detail about what these different parameters are shortly. But let's get it moving. Let's get this new app being created. Started a build straight away. You should see in the background in OpenShift that the mono source deployment configuration has been created. Let's go and see what's going on with the builds. So if we have a look, we've created a build config which has got some builds in it. If we have a look at the builds, there's our first build and it's running. So if we want to go and have a look at that, this is actually a pod in OpenShift, which is only temporary while it does the build and it's off and running and it's creating an image for me based on that uh, template and based on my source control. So um, the other parameters that I've uh, provided as part of this new app command, um, by default, the uh, template uses a, um, uh, an EAP quick start. Um, so it's already expecting to get um, some information from a source repository reference and a context, di context directory. So I have made them blank because I'm not interested in that. I'm using my own repo, as you can see. I don't want anything to do with the quick start repos. So I'm just um, overriding those with, with blanks. Okay, what is actually going on in OpenShift while this build is going on? And don't worry about the pulled fail message, it always says that. What's actually happening is a whole bunch of OpenShift objects are being created. As you can see, we've got the build config that I mentioned earlier, we've got an input stream, um, which is this location of where, the, where to get the image from. You'll also notice that in networking, we've created a service for the application and a route, which is the ingress. So from the outside world, I'm able to reach this application. Uh, just by the way, this OpenShift instance is hosted on Amazon AWS. Obviously, it could be on-premise, it could be wherever you like. Uh, uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is in the cloud, this is on Amazon AWS. Obviously, the other thing that I've created, which we've, uh, which we've seen already, under workloads, we can see our deployment configuration, which is this. Uh, and once the build has finished, the deployment configuration will kick in and it will start to spin up a pod for me with the, um, with the running uh, container. We've also got some pods and you can see the activity of the pods. The build actually has finished uh, because we've already spun up a deployment pod and it is running a pod with this little generated uh, sequence in it. That is the pod that's going to have my application in it. In fact, if we look at the log for this pod, you should recognize some of this. Hopefully a message flew by there saying deploy the monolith war. And this is all kind of standard EAP uh, logging information, which you should be relatively familiar with. So if we now look at our pods again, just check the progress of this. I think that this is now running and ready, this pod. If I go to my root and go to the URL, that's exposed, I've got a JBoss EAP instance. I haven't got my app because at the moment, my route is just going to the root of the container. However, if I tag monolith on the end, which is the name of my deployment, there's my application. Now it doesn't do very much right now and specifically it doesn't connect to a database because there's a lot of configuration that I haven't done yet. As you can see, the result of that test is an error. There's no database there. There's also no message. That message is gonna come from an external property file, which I haven't configured yet. So that's the basics, building blocks, getting an application up and running in OpenShift. How long did that take? Uh, I don't know, about five minutes or so. So what I'm gonna do now is go for a different uh, repository. Let's say this time I don't have source code, I have a built WAR. Well, you can actually use exactly the same process and exactly the same template 
to deploy a pre-built WAR file. If you create a project, exactly the same POM as the previous one, with basically nothing in it, no source code in it, just a deployment directory with the WAR file, that will still allow the template to build this application. Effectively, all it does is it just does a, a, a standard image build and then the deployment. So let's see how we do that. I'm going to create another application using the same OC new app, using the same template, in fact. Just clear my screen up again. But crucially, it will have a few differences. For example, the name is going to be different. I've already got an app named Monolith Source. I've also got a whole bunch of objects called Monosource. I've got my deployment configuration, my build configuration, my image stream, my service, my root. All of that stuff is named Monosource after the previous uh, new app command. So because this is all in the same namespace on the same project, I want to make sure that I make a distinction. So actually, let's just have a look at what we've currently got in um, uh, OpenShift, we'll have a look and see here, we've got Monolith Source, that's our original one. I'm going to kick off this second one, and we should see straight away, I've now got a Monolith Built app with a Mono Built um, deployment configuration inside it. Okay, while I'm doing that, and while that build is off and running, uh, I am going to just show you a couple of additional uh, useful features of OC. Uh, if we just have a look at our pods for a minute, we've got the running pod uh, for the uh, mono source. We've also got a build pod for the mono built, which is the second app. Mono source, I don't really need anymore. I'm actually going to get rid of it. But before I do, let me just say I'll scale it down. So I do OC scale, and the number of replicas I want is zero. So I want to get it down to zero so that this pod effectively goes away. What am I scaling down? I'm scaling down the deployment configuration called Monosource. So I do that, and what should happen is that, that this pod will actually start terminating. So we'll see that uh, hopefully happening in a minute. Um, oh, that would be because I've done Monosource, which doesn't exist. If I get it right, this just demonstrates that it is actually live, folks. Uh, there you go, the pod is terminating. So he's coming down. A couple of other useful features here. When you're talking about apps and applications, it can get a little bit confusing because you see you've got an app called Monolith Built with an application called MonoBuilt, which is what all of the objects in this application are actually called. If I do OC get all, I can use a selector and I can either use an app or an application. So if I do app monolith source, there are all the objects that are named monolith source or, or belong, if you like, are labeled with the app name monolith source. And a similar thing I can do with application as the selector. The only problem with that is there's nothing with an application name of monolith source. It's actually called mono source. And there you go, there's loads of stuff. Now, for clearing down purposes, very useful. This is the only way I've ever found of doing this in OpenShift. How do you delete an application from a project and all the things related to the application? Well, you use OC delete all with a selector of app equals, in this case, monolith source, and it should get rid of all of that. So it's actually disappeared from my console in the background as well. Okay. How's our new build doing? Let's go and have a look. Hopefully, I've waffled on sufficiently that the build itself has actually completed. Let's have a look at the builds. Monolith build is complete. How about the deployment configuration? Well, it's spun up a pod. So, should have also created a root, root called mono build. And yet again, it spun up my EAP for me. And there's my application. So that all worked as well, straight from the uh, from the pre-built WAR file. Uh, just because this is starting to get annoying with the root, I'm actually going to edit that now. So in my root, I'm going to go and change something. And actually, all I want to do here is I want to add a path to it. So I'm going to do that now. Slash monolith, because that's actually where I want the root to go. Make sure I spelt it right this time. Save it. Now, if I go back to the root, back to the URL, 
it loads up my application immediately, which is great. So that's the process. That's how you actually get to the point where you've got these applications running in OpenShift. But obviously, certainly for those of you that know anything about EAP, that is not nearly enough. What we need to be able to do is to start configuring this stuff. So let's just have a little look at the pod itself, go inside it and see what that configuration looks like. Uh, I've got a very useful command here to find out what running pods I've got, which is OC get pods. Those are all my running pods. And an even better command, really useful one, this RSH, which is to remotely connect into the pod. You've got to get the pod name, got to get it the right running pod. And you're logged into the pod. What's in here? Well, first of all, where am I? I'm in the home JBoss because that's the user I'm running. Remember, OpenShift doesn't run containers as root. It runs them uh, as a secured user. Um, what else have I got in here? Well, I've got the standard EAP directory structure, pretty much. So I've got standalone. I've got deployments. You should be able to find that, lo and behold, I've got a monolith wire deployed in my deployments directory. I've also got a configuration directory, what's in there. We've got all the standard EAP files that I'd be used to, plus one extra one. Standalone OpenShift XML, this is actually the configuration that is running. So if I wanted to change anything about this configuration, then I would need to edit the standalone OpenShift XML file. Not standalone, not HA, not full, not any of the other ones. And this is what the configuration file looks like. It's got a few interesting things in it, like some placeholders where you could add data sources and stuff like that. We're going to be seeing that a little later on in the demo. Um, but otherwise, it looks pretty much like a bog standard um, standalone XML file. Now, I could obviously make configuration changes in here. But of course, if I did that, I would be a moron. Why? Because this is an ephemeral pod. I spin up another one, or I shut this application down for a while, then bring it up again, then any changes are going to be completely lost. Everything is ephemeral here. It's temporary. You know, the whole point is any configuration that I want to make should actually be in the OpenShift environment, not in a running pod. So how do I do that? I'm going to come out my running pod now. How do I actually do that? Well, there's one really pretty simple way of doing this. What I can do is I can add to my repo and I can add a configuration directory in here with the file standalone OpenShift XML with whatever changes I desire. And then with that pre-built configuration, I can do a new build of the uh, container and I will have all of my configuration in there. So let's do that first of all. This is not necessarily the optimum solution, but it might be a solution for some of you, particularly if you've got very weird and wonderful configuration. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy the standalone XML from my running pod. I'm going to put it in my repo and then I'm going to kick off a rebuild. So let's see how, how we do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a directory. I should be in the right place for my repo at the moment. Yes, I am. So I'm going to make a directory called configuration. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to copy the file from the running pod. How do I do that? I use a command called OCRsync. I should still have the name of the running pod on my clipboard. Hurrah, I still do. That's effectively my host name for an OpenShift perspective. So what am I copying? Opt, EAP, standalone. This is where you have to suffer much of me type. Sorry about that. Standalone, configuration, and the file is standalone openshift.xml. And it should copy it, well, I want it in my configuration directory on my, uh, my project. So should have got that file now. We should find actually my file system now. I've got, there it is, a standalone OpenShift XML, which I just copied from the running pod. Really useful that, the, um, the rsync. It, you can copy to a running pod or from a running pod. It's a very useful little command. So I'm going to open up that file. And guess what? I'm going to make some changes to it. I'm actually going to put a system property in there. I'm going to copy this system property that I prepared earlier called myprop. And later on, we'll see after we've done the build, that myprop should be available to me in the AP and should have a value. I'm going to do one more thing in this file. Now, the way that these templates work is that they work on a build level and then a deployment level. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have my configuration file in my build. Yeah, because I'm going to put it inside my source. Um, 
But if I do that, what's going to happen at deployment time is that EAP is, try, is going to try and create some data sources for me. So actually, I want to get rid of the default data source that's already here, both the data source definition and the reference to it in default binding. So I'm getting rid of that because otherwise the deployment config will get horribly confused uh, because it's trying to create a default data source on top of one that already exists. So that's the reason that I'm doing this right now. Okay, I've done that. I've changed my file and I'm happy with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into GitHub. So I'm going to add the configuration change, which, uh, which isn't there right now. I'm going to commit it with a message you just said added config. I'm going to push it, which will push it to my repo. And just in order to save time right now, I'm going to kick off another build as well. So I'm going to do OC start build and it's mono build, which will kick off basically a second build of this. And it should kick it off. Okay, so what changes did I make to my repo? Let's refresh this. We've got a configuration directory now with a standalone OpenShift.xml file inside it. What is that doing inside of OpenShift? Well, if I have a look at my builds, here's MonoBuild2, which is running. Here's the log. It's off and running as you would normally expect. Um, my deployment config will um, update uh, momentarily. My um, monobuilt pod uh, will uh, come down once this build is completed. Okay, so that's a, I suppose, what you might call a brute force configuration change, which is putting the configuration effectively hard coded inside the uh, repo and having it all built from there. Not the optimum way of doing it. For starters, um, I'm going to need to change the build if I want my configuration to change going from dev to test to prod or whatever. So again, that's not optimum sort of having that configuration baked into the image. What I'm going to show you in a few minutes is a way to change that configuration so that you can have a um, effectively set of environment variables injected in at deployment time as opposed to build time. Now, one of the other configuration changes that you might be keen on making um, when you're doing uh, uh, EAP deployments, and that is um, heap size, configuring the memory heap size. I took the liberty of uh, bringing up this link here, which is an explanation of how you can change container memory or the, the amount of memory that EAP is using within the container. Basically, there's a lot of options here. By default, if you have set limits on your container, which you should have done really, then JBoss EAP will use half of that. So if it's a one gig container limit, then uh, you'll use 50% of that fee for your uh, for your heap size. There are ways of overriding it, container heap percent, Java max memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't set any limits on your container, which is a very dangerous thing to do because it could grab all the memory off your host, um, then uh, it will default to the standard JBoss EAP7 um, standalone conf, which is a gig. It's an S1.3 uh, thousand meg. So um, let's have a look at what we've actually got in OpenShift right now. If we have a look at our deployment configuration, we should see inside the YAML here that we have got a one gig um, resource limit which means that this container cannot use more than one gig of memory, um, which is good because that means that there's no risk involved there and effectively we'll get 50% of that for, for EAP. And in actual fact, if we go back and describe the template again, you will see not only is it possible to set the limits here in the deployment config, it's also possible to set them when we create a new app in the template. Right at the bottom there, the last parameter is memory limit. So at any time when you're creating a new application using this template, this source to image template, you can specify a memory limit for the container. And once again, I would strongly recommend that you use the container limits, the OpenShift limits, as opposed to anything within EAP itself, because that's going to be much more uh, safe uh, in terms of potentially blowing the, uh, the memory that you've got on the, on the underlying host. Okay, once again, that should be sufficient preamble for the build to have actually completed. 
So if we have a look at the builds, well, Monon build two is complete. And if I have a look at my pods, I've got a new pod up and running. Let's just check the route to see if my new application is in place. It is, but actually that's, that's not really what I'm that interested in. I'm more interested in the running pod because I want to go in and see if my, uh, my system properties there. So if we do get pods, there it is. If I do RSH to log into the running pod. And we're in. I'm going to do something slightly different this time. I'm actually going to go into the CLI of JBoss. Connect into that. And now CLI, have I got a system property? Goodness me, I have, it's called my prop. Can I see it? Read resource. Yeah, the value is one, two, three, four, one. So my custom configuration has gone in to the pod. But as I said before, I don't think this is the optimum way of doing it because um, you're, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, you can't really do any uh, configuration as you change from, uh, as you promote from uh, environments. So I'm actually going to wind this back. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the configuration directory. Uh, Git would help. You're, really, you're getting the best of my spelling here, folks. Um, I'm going to commit that. I deleted the config. Uh, I'm going to push it. And I'm going to kick off, kick off another build. And again, um, what some of you may be thinking here is, well, why don't you just create a, a webhook um, so that as soon as you commit something to the Git repo, it automatically builds, uh, kicks off the build in OpenShift. And I can absolutely do that. It's just a bit boring to set it up in the demo, so I haven't bothered, that's all. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely could do that. I could very easily kick off a new build of OpenShift, um, of the OpenShift image, uh, just by checking into GitHub. But hopefully now in GitHub, uh, when we look at Mono Build, it's no longer got a configuration directory. That's cool. And I don't want to do that because I want to use environment variables to inject uh, the configuration that I need, uh, because that way my deployment configs can be different for each environment. Um, so let's have a look at how I actually do this. In order to inject um, environment information into deployment configs, you need to create what are called config maps or secrets. You may have heard of these before, but they're basically a way of um, injecting into uh, a deployment certain information that you only want at configuration time. And you can do this in two ways. You can do it as environment variables, or you can do it as a what we call a volume mount, which means effectively mounting a volume inside the running pod. And we're going to do both. The particular one I want to start with is with data sources, and I'm going to inject some environment variables into uh, my uh, configuration to create a data source. Again, there's some documentation which explains how to do this. You need to have environment variables with very specific names, which the template can read. All of the EAP templates read these sorts of um, uh, environment variables. And the main one is this one called DB service prefix mapping which is a name of a data source which you can then use to configure anything you want about this data source, including all of these parameters here. So you can configure the pool size, you can configure the security, whether it's XA, non-XA, uh, the um, connection URL, all that stuff can be configured here. But you need to have this prefix first. Uh, and the main reason for that is because this is a way that you can create multiple data sources on the fly if you need to. Let me show you an example, which hopefully might make things a little bit uh, more um, uh, sensible. Here's an example that I've got for a data source called a monolith MySQL. And in fact, when this is created, the actual J and the I name of the data source will be called monolith MySQL. This is the um, uh, the prefix monolith, 
And you'll notice that I've got it twice, first in lowercase, second in capitals. You have to do it that way. That's the way that uh, the template reads it. But once you've got this prefix, you can use it to configure all of the other parameters about the data source. And as I said, as I said earlier, you can actually create a comma separated list of data sources and configure them all in a single file if you want to, like this. All right, how do I get a config map into here? Well, I could create uh, individual config maps. I could create a set of name value pairs. I'm actually gonna use this file, which is the easiest way to do it. So there's an OC command that will do this for me. Doing this in the GUI, by the way, is kind of painful and it's not really feasible. But if we look at this OC command, what I'm gonna do is create a config map. It's called dbparams. And it's not gonna come just from a file. It's gonna come from an environment file. This is an environment file to set a name value pairs called dbparams.txt. I'm gonna execute that. And I think what you'll find here is that once my config map is created, there it is. We've actually got a nice screen that shows me what every environment variable name is and what every value is. You'll notice the ones that are missing, monolith username, monolith password. Don't wanna show you them. I want them to be in a secret. So I'm gonna create a DB cred secret, which basically does exactly the same thing, just gets it from a file. And I'm not gonna show you that file either because I don't want you to see these credentials. The only difference between the config map and the secret is that I need an extra keyword here because you can create lots and lots of different types of secret in OpenShift. Secrets used all over the place in OpenShift. This is a generic secret. I'm gonna create that based on the file. There's my DB cred secret, which has just been created. And you'll notice that it's very helpfully masked out the key values there. And I'm not gonna hit reveal values because then you'd see them. Even if you look in the YAML, you won't see them, which is kind of good. Okay, now that I've created those, what I actually want to do is I want to attach them up to my deployment configuration. My build should have well finished by now. So I look at my pods, I should have now uh, my latest build number three, which doesn't have the uh, standalone XML in it anymore. I'm gonna let the template take care of all this. All I'm gonna do is inject my, um, uh, my config map and my secret into this deployment config. And I can do that in the GUI actually very easily. If I go to environment, a whole bunch of other parameters being passed here, which I'm not using, but I've got a nice little option here to take all of the values from a config map or from a secret and throw them all into my deployment configuration. So I'm gonna do that. That should kick off, not a build, just a redeployment. If we actually have a look at the build, still on the third build, that hasn't changed. But if I go to my pods, my previous pod is terminating and a new deployment pod is coming up. When that pod does come up, we should be able to go in there, have a little look at it, and uh, see if that uh, configuration has actually taken, uh, taken shape. Right, got my pod, let's go in and have a quick look at it. So RSH into it. This list is getting long now, isn't it, pods? This is the one. Mm, just about there. Uh, let's go into the CLI again. Looks like that pod is ready now anyway in the background. So let's go and look at subsystems. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Let's go back into my CLI. And go back into subsystems, uh, data sources, data source. Oh, look at that, I've got a data source called monolith, MySQL monolith. Let's read one of the attributes on that. And I'll read the uh, J and the I name attributes, I think. Whoops, typing again. There it is, J and the I name of monolith MySQL. Exciting stuff. If I run my root now, I'm obviously playing slightly fast and loose with the word exciting. There's my application. If I try a data source called Monolith MySQL, and I happen to know on this database, this is a database up in the cloud, that there's an event table, 
goodness me, it's selected some data. Fantastic. All right. The last piece of this particular jigsaw is loading a uh, an external uh, properties file. Now, even though everything looked absolutely hunky dory with that deployment, if I go back and have a quick look at this pod, it's actually throwing a horrible exception. File not found. That's because that little message at the bottom of the screen is supposed to be being loaded from a file in the running pod that lives in Opdeep standalone configuration props monolith.properties. Now I've got a monolith.properties file sat here. And it's got exactly what the app is expecting. It's got a, a, a parameter, an environment variable message, and a uh, and a little message there, which will print on the screen or should print on the screen. The problem is the file's not there. How do I get the file into the pod? I'll show you. We're going to use another config map. This time, rather than loading environment files, we're just going to load a file, the whole of this monolith.properties file. And the command that I'm going to use is that what it's done is just taken the whole file and it's loaded it uh, as a properties file there's the, the um, config map it's called props file and as you can see there's the key name and here's the value but again I don't want to chuck this in as an environment variable I want to do it as a volume mount if I look at the actual overview of the deployment config Any volume mounts would be listed here, I haven't got any at the moment, but using the OC set volume command, very handy look command. And I'll just talk you through the options of this. I'm gonna add this to the monobuild deployment config. Yeah, it's a new thing I'm adding to the deployment config. It's a config map type of mount. I'm gonna give it the name props mount. It's using the config map uh, props file, which I created earlier, and crucially, look where it's going to mount it. Opt EAP standalone configuration props. That's where it's going to mount it. Hopefully, that's created the volume mount. There it is. And because yet again I've updated my deployment configuration, that should automatically spin up another deployment. So what we should find once this pod uh, actually gets up and running, the old number four goes away and the number five comes up, is we should find that that's got a, an extra component on the file system. And crucially in my application, it'll load up my little message. It's a very common use case. Yeah? Um, most of the customers that I talk to who are using EAP uh, have got some form of externalized application properties file. And the great thing about this is that this file can look completely different per environment and it's all stored in the deployment configuration of OpenShift. Yeah, so it's not stored necessarily in your source code, as you really want it to be, and it's not baked into the image. You don't have to do an image rebuild every time you do this. I think the pod is ready. My levels of excitement are almost unbearable at this point. Um, I'm going to go into the pod. And there it is, number five. And uh, this time I'm just going to go into the file system. So opt EAP, standalone configuration. What's in here? Goodness me, there's a props directory. And would you look at that? The monolith.properties file is in there. And let's go to my root and have a little look at my application. Hello to everyone on the webinar. Well, unfortunately, it's hello and goodbye because that's pretty much the end of my demo now. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I think Andy is going to grab control back. I'm going to mute. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John. That was great. Um, hoping I'm just going to click this back. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we've been looking at there is um, that it's relatively quick to rehost. Uh, in this case, it was an EAP application, an on-premise EAP application. Rehost it, reconfigure it, and so on onto OpenShift, and that gives us those benefits of 
the fast moving monolith that we were talking about earlier. So we've really been focusing on the rehosting piece. That's the sort of top light blue bit in the uh, in the diagram we're looking at there. Um, and as I was saying earlier, that's very much the simplest application option, uh, modernization option. The majority of organizations depend, as you know, on existing applications. And as we were saying earlier, it just could be too expensive or too risky to redevelop. But you know, hopefully you can see that, that there are some benefits to, to be achieved. We also briefly touched on replatforming and refactoring. I think what's clear here is that in your suite of uh, your portfolio of applications, not every application is necessarily a candidate for the same option. You may decide that some are fine for rehosting, others for a complete redevelopment and so on. So really there's no sort of one size fits all. What that means in terms of architecture and development is that we might need different technical solutions uh, to modernize versus you know, brand new developments, for example. And so development teams might need a variety of tools you know, the right tool for a particular job, but they may require access to multiple languages, frameworks, and so on. So what Red Hat provides as a potential help for this, is what they call ROAR, uh, Red Hat OpenShift Application Runtimes, and it's effectively a collection of different types of technologies and, and frameworks and so on, all under the same subscription. So you can see on the right-hand side there, there's the uh, Java EE and JBoss EAP one, which is very relevant to what John was doing. But there are other technologies and frameworks and so on as well, which are included, all under the same subscription. So the alternative really there is to buy different licenses, different subscriptions, and have them managed and so on in different ways, as opposed to Roar, which its idea is to give your development team uh, supports uh, fully tested, verified runtimes and frameworks for all of your um, application migration needs. Okay, so we're going to send you some details of Roar a little bit uh, later on. I didn't want to spend too much time on that, just to show that there is a one-stop shop Red Hat subscription that, m that might help on top of uh, OpenShift itself. Okay, so just to wrap up then, thank you very much for attending. I hope you find it useful. Um, we will follow up later today with some information about cloud native development generally and also Roar. Um, just to remind uh, you though why we were talking about this. So we talk about tier two being a you know, Red Hat delivery partner and that's fine. The majority of work that we do is services based uh, work. And in this particular instance, you know, we can help you plan and potentially migrate onto OpenShift to give you the benefit of those cloud native techniques, whether it's as the seminar, the webinar was focusing on today, just rehosting and into the fast moving monolith idea, or actually complete re-architecture as well. Got some contacts there uh, as well. If you'd like to get in touch, please do. Um, as I say, we'll be sending out some email follow-ups later. And we would be absolutely delighted to, to talk to you further about you know, what your plans are and whether or not we can help and uh, whether OpenShift and Roar you know, might be something that's useful to you as well. So uh, thanks very much again for attending. Particular thanks to John. It's always very brave, I think, to do a live demo, and it truly was live. Um, so uh, it's always a very brave thing to do. So thanks again. Hopefully you got a lot out of the session today. And um, again, I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks very much indeed.